playing Dread Delusion feels like something between a fever dream and a drug trip, and I mean that in the best way possible. The eerie yet charming setting had me hooked from the get-go, and the story, lore building, and exploration kept me in for the long haul. Along the way, I saw some of the weirdest crap I've seen in a game in a long time, as well as an abundance of mushrooms, and I'm pretty excited to share the experience with you. My name's Johnny Bueno, and let's take a look at Dread Delusion. Dread Delusion does a pretty good job at grabbing you with its story right off the bat. Like any good RPG, you start out in prison. You're then given several prompts that detail your character's backstory in addition to affecting your starting stats. After that, you're given your objective. Capture the leader of a notorious mercenary band or rot in prison. The mystery and buildup of this leader, Vila Kalos, is what makes Dread Delusion's story so gripping. Many NPCs you'll meet will tell you tales of her ventures, and she's kind of built up to be like this legendary figure in the game world. You meet her briefly at the start, but she gets away and you're sent off to gather her former comrades and attempt to save her or take her down for good. This is what kept me hooked on the game's plot as I wanted to find out more about Vila's backstory and uncover why she's seemingly gone off the deep end. Because of this, I think the developers did a great job of teasing you with a great deal of mystery at the start of the game, and it makes you want to unravel it and follow it to its conclusion. I should mention though that there isn't actually a conclusion to the story, as the game is still very much in early access. The main plot only goes so far, but what's already there is pretty engrossing. The world itself is composed of several floating islands known as the Onric Isles, and they hover over a land that has been rendered completely uninhabitable. The Onric Isles are ruled by the Apostatic Union, who really aren't a fan of gods and god worship, which is why they've completely outlawed it. Between NPC text, lore books, and just general world exploration, there's some impressively deep lore in Dread Delusion for a yet-to-be-finished game. I was genuinely interested in learning what led to the current state of the world, and like with Vila, the game does a great job at teasing you with some minor details at the start, while leaving it up to the player to dig deeper. Who knows, you may even come across a god or two in your journey. One thing I did love about Dread Delusion was the way the world was presented. It's a pretty unique blend of typical fantasy with a very alien-like twist. This, I think, is where a lot of the comparisons to the Elder Scrolls Morrowind come into play, and I honestly do see the similarities, though Dread Delusion appears to be far more… deranged? Between the neutron star that orbits the land dictating day and night, the elder tours, the meat farms, the meat doors, and overall eerie nature of the Onric Isles, Dread Delusion's setting paints us a very grim world that I found to be absolutely unforgettable. Graphically, the game is vibrant to say the least. It feels like games with retro PlayStation 1 style graphics are a dime a dozen nowadays, but Dread Delusion pulls this off quite well due to its grim world and overall game UI, which feels like it was ripped right out of your favorite RPG from the 90s. Though there are some fairly nauseating graphical effects that are turned on by default, like Wobbly 3D, which, while kind of nice as it gives the trees and giant mushrooms some life, left me feeling pretty motion sick. Luckily, this can be turned off in the settings menu, so if you get motion sick easily like me, you'll be able to save yourself from having to clean puke off your keyboard. At its heart, Dread Delusion's combat is a pretty simple dance of attacking, backing away from an enemy attack, then attacking again. At least, that's how it is at melee range. I didn't experience this much because I was too busy pelting enemies with spells and killing them before they even got to me. With the more magic-focused build, I was able to one or two shot nearly every enemy I was coming across, and I'm not exaggerating. Even if an enemy was able to close the gap on me, it was pretty easy to just run away or kite them and then finish them off with another spell. Most enemies will just kind of slowly run at you anyway or cast easy-to-dodge projectiles, so there wasn't much difficulty with enemy encounters to begin with. It really did feel like melee and magic weren't created equal in Dread Delusion, especially since I was this powerful with the very first offensive spell I picked up, so enemies never really posed a challenge. Not to mention you can pick up other incredibly useful spells, like one that seemingly regenerates your entire health bar, or one that increases your speed exponentially so you can zip across the map faster than a blue hedgehog. So a pure melee build probably isn't the way to go, as you might be missing out on some extremely handy spells. Even if the combat is somewhat lackluster, where Dread Delusion truly shines is the exploration. There's plenty of treasure chests and oddities to be found, and I had a blast scouring every inch of each zone for something to pick up. While the world isn't necessarily massive like other open-world RPGs, the Onric Isles has plenty of interesting landmarks to explore without too much boring, empty space between them. When starting out, you can almost always see something in the distance that you haven't been to yet, and I think that's what makes exploring Dread Delusion's world so exciting. On top of that, leveling up your character is also tied to exploring the world and unlocking secrets, so players are highly encouraged to leave no stone unturned if they want to optimize their character. As an open-world RPG, Dread Delusion also offers plenty of quests to undertake that will take you to every corner of the floating islands. Some are funny, some are downright disturbing, and some actually leave the player with a serious choice to make. There are a few quests that will have you obtain some critical item for a faction, only to leave you with a choice of handing it into that faction, or giving it to someone else, affecting the outcome of the quest. I love this as I feel like emphasizing player choice is never a bad thing, and it helps the world, story, and your role in it feel so much more dynamic. 
This also affects the game's faction system, where there are different reputation levels for each faction, and improving your reputation will grant you specific rewards. I found myself favoring the god-hating apostatic union for my playthrough, and after improving my reputation level to friendly, I was granted access to a neat little room containing a creepy face that would grant me a temporary buff to one of my skills. Overall, it's an interesting system that encourages multiple playthroughs if you want to see what every faction has to offer. Like I mentioned in the previous section, progressing with your character is tied to exploring and interacting with the world. There's no experience gained through defeating enemies. The only way to level up is through either finding delusions or completing quests. Delusions are these floating skulls you'll find throughout the world, typically in hidden spots or behind locked doors that require you to lockpick your way into. After obtaining a certain number of delusions, you'll be granted one point to invest into one of four core stats. Might, Guile, Wisdom, and Persona. This just further hits home the game's emphasis on exploration, as you can't just grind enemies to power up your character. Although I did notice through casually exploring areas and doing some quests here and there, I was able to max out some of my stats pretty quickly. The current version of the game only has a cap of 10 for each of the four stats, and I maxed out Wisdom well before I was finished with the game, which probably also contributed to how easily I was taking down enemies. I maxed out my Persona stat by the time I made it to the second major zone as well, so I'm hoping the full version of the game will either have slower leveling or higher stat caps. Otherwise, most of the content will be pretty easy to steamroll. Going back to the core stats, each one has an effect on two specific skills. Might affects attack and defense, Guile affects lockpicking and agility, Wisdom affects lore and spellcast, and Persona affects charm and barter. Each skill can also be increased through wearing specific gear as well, like robes increasing spellcast, and they can be important in determining how you interact with the game world. Charm unlocks specific dialogue options with NPCs, and if you've ever played any Elder Scrolls or Fallout game, then you know how overpowered talking can be. Dread Delusion also takes an interesting approach to lockpicking, which is determined by a dice roll. My understanding is that the higher your lockpicking skill is, the more likely you'll get a high dice roll and be able to lockpick the door. But that didn't seem to matter much as I barely touched my lockpicking skill and I was usually able to open doors with a roll of 5 or 6 just through repeated attempts. Agility, which is also affected by your Guile stat, simply increases your jump height and run speed, which was also rendered kind of pointless simply by casting the previously mentioned Boost Agility spell. My point is, some skills felt far more useful than others, and there will likely need to be some sort of balancing done before the game's release to make them all equally as rewarding to invest points in too. Dread Dilution also features gear upgrade and alchemy systems. You can upgrade pieces of gear through collecting ores and thread, and you can craft potions by combining different plants found throughout the game world. These actions can be done at their respective crafting stations, and it's overall very basic open-world RPG stuff, and there's really nothing wrong with that. Finding materials just gives you another reason to keep your eyes open when exploring the world, and some of the rarer materials are fairly well hidden, so I think there's a decent level of excitement when you find one. The last thing I want to mention is that you can also get your own manor through a side quest, and this appears to be where you'll sink a great deal of money and materials into if you want to spruce it into shape. There's far more to it than making it visually appealing though, as you can build additional sections to your manor, like a garden or library, that will unlock teleportation points, or let you access books that will give you some additional world lore. But I like that it was something you could consistently come back to, so you're not always sitting on an abundance of resources without any idea what to do with them. Completing the manor feels like another fun, long-term goal to achieve, alongside completing the main quest. Dread Delusion shows an immense amount of promise for a game in early access. Despite its simple and somewhat unbalanced combat, the strange, grim world and impressively deep lore do more than enough to help the game stand out from countless other fantasy-based open-world RPGs. And with plenty of content to be added until full release, Dread Delusion has the potential to shape into something truly special. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like and let me know what you think in the comments below. I appreciate every bit of interaction and support, as I love making videos just like this. So, please subscribe if you want to see more, and thank you for watching.